shapes and, and I'd like to do some sound to bring to peace whatever is going on with you, physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. We set sacred space now. We ask for help from many of our guides, ascended masters, Archangels, and positive aliens, only for our highest good. Welcome to another presentation at the Globe Sound Healing Conference. Today, our or this presentation is with John Stuart Reed. Hi, John. Hi, it's a pleasure to be with you today. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, Thank you. John is an acoustics engineer and scientist. He studied the world of sound for over 40 years. 
and speaks extensively on his research findings to audiences throughout the U.S. and the United Kingdom and Europe. He's a regular speaker at the Water Conference, currently, currently held in Germany, where he has presented lectures on the holographic properties of sound, water, memory, abiogenesis. Is that right? Abiogenesis? Yeah. <laughs> his, la uh, his last lecture carried the title, Sound is an Aspect of Life, but Life is Life an Aspect of Sound. He's the inventor of the Cymoscope Pro instrument. It's at cymoscope.com, and his work is inspired by acoustic in pioneers Ernst Chladny, Mary D. Waller, and Hans Jenny, and has taken their fi findings to a new level. His primary interest lie in investigating sound as a formative force and discovering why sound heals. One of his primary goals is to educate and inspire the world in the field of cymatics, the study of visible sound because seeing sound allows us to more fully understand this omnipresent aspect of our world and our universe. He's begun to write a series of lessons for children based on the STEAM acronym, Science, Technology, Engineering, Art and Mathematics, and a junior Cymoscope model is currently in development, intended for use by teachers and students in science classroom settings. His research is helping to elevate cymatics as an important new field in the scientific arena, including a study of how dolphins see with sound, published in the Journal of Marine Biology. His two recent studies are focused on the effects of music on the longevity of red blood cells, with a preliminary report published by experiment.com, and on differentiating between the sounds emitted by healthy cells and cancer cells a scientific paper published in the Water Journal. <laughs> You're not bored, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to lately? Tell me more. Uh, quite a lot, actually, quite a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, this has been a fascinating journey for me, which is, you know, my life started as an acoustics engineer, but um, my business interests were weighing heavily on me. And by the time I got to, what, 1996 or 1990, yeah, 96, I'd already been an acoustics engineer for 30 years at that point in business. And uh, I decided it was time for a change, you know, because really my passion had always been science. And, um, you know, but you have to make a living. And I knew that, you know, that not wasn't necessarily the best way to make my living. So, I mean, talking about science. So in 97, what happened that really changed my life forever were, was a visit to the Great Pyramid acoustics experiments. I'm sure that many of your um, delegates, viewers will already know this story. But for me, it really changed my life. So for those viewers who don't know the story, uh, in essence, um, I, I needed to conduct some acoustics experiments in the Great Pyramid uh, because I'd had an experience there a year before um, in which I, I'd lay in the sarcophagus, you know, this 3.7 ton granite box has been hollowed out. I lay in the sarcophagus and I toned, I made a, a basically a vocal glissando and at one particular frequency, every cell in my body seemed to tingle and goosebumps broke out all over my flesh. And I realized that something very special was happening in that sarcophagus. Of course, the sarcophagus is made of as one granite. It's, uh, it's got a very high quartz crystal content, but it's also extraordinarily resonant. And so this vocal, you know, lying in it and making a vocal Glissando um, caused at one particular frequency, one particular pitch, um, to, to cause this tingling effect all over my body. So that was early in 96, actually. And then. Oh, John, John, uh, I, while yeah. you're here, I have to tell you, excuse me. Sure. I did the exact same thing in the sarcophagus. I did a, a frequency sweep and found the resonant frequency. And when I hit that resonant frequency, I went out of my body into the Akashic records. And there, wow. was a, uh, there was a guy there guarding a door. And I said, it was like underneath the pyramid, right? I'm like in, in another zone. And I said, can I yeah. come in? And he says, no, your consciousness is not high enough. 
And I go, oh, shit, shit. Whoa. And about, about a half an hour later, <laughs> the uh, tourists cleared out, and I went in the sarcophagus, sarcophagus again and toned that note and went out of my body and went to the door with the guard and said, can I come in? And he says, yes. And he opens up the door, and energy comes streaming up my spine, which was more like information. And yeah. ever since then, I haven't been the same. Wow. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> you had a what very note, similar what, experience. What note is it? It's 117 hertz. At uh -huh. least I, I, you know, I, I found that out later, of course. You know, at the time, uh -huh. just using my vocal apparatus, I didn't know that. I knew it was certainly in the order of 100 hertz. But, but later that same year, 96, I went back, you know, armed with all of the acoustics instrumentation. I gained special permission to do the experiments. And mm -hmm. although those particular experiments were really um, extraordinarily successful, the one experiment that I could not do in 96, but really wanted to do, uh, was a cymatics experiment with the sarcophagus. Because, you know, it's one thing to map the resonances, say, in this case of the sarcophagus using conventional instrumentation, you know, conventional acoustics instrumentation of spectrographs and so on. Uh, it's quite another to, to make visible sound using cymatic principles. Uh, you learn a whole lot more than you, than you would learn with the simple uh, electronic uh, analysis methods. So anyway, in 97, I went back again, and it was the 97 uh, experience that really changed my life completely in every way. Um, so what happened was about three weeks before going out to Egypt in 97, I quite badly injured my lower back. And uh, to the extent that I was in so much pain that I thought I was going to have to cancel the whole mission. Uh, but in the end, I just sort of, I took probably more painkillers than I should have done, gritted my teeth and, you know, somehow with help got into the pyramid and other people obviously carried in the equipment. So I'm going to keep this very short because we've got a lot of material to cover here. But I just want to say, you know, that the essence of what happened that day um, so that you, the viewers can understand how it changed my life so radically. So the first thing was the experiment was designed to make visible the resonances in that sarcophagus, which I've already said is extraordinarily resonant, okay? So I fixed the broken corner. You can see at the bottom right-hand corner here, you know, it's all broken away. I mm -hmm. fixed that. I used gaffer tape with uh, styrofoam blocks, and did a temporary fix, and you also an aluminium uh, right angle. And then I stretched a membrane across the top of the sarcophagus, having leveled it very carefully all the way around, um, and then uh, weighted that membrane with, uh, with sand bags all the way around the perimeter of the membrane. And in the bottom, instead of me lying in the bottom of the sarcophagus, I put a small speaker connected obviously to a, a signal generator. And, um, and then sprinkle sand on the membrane and switched on the oscillator. Bearing in mind, I was in agony all of this time because I, like I said, injured my lower back. Um, then what happened was <laughs> absolutely amazing because the very first frequency that I looked at, by the way, the antiquities inspector was, you know, in the background here, he's standing in the King's chamber filing his nails and looking extraordinarily bored and thinking that this Englishman's crazy, you know, but um, he's not doing any damage to the sarcophagus, so let him do what he's doing. Anyway, he wasn't interested at all in what I was doing. Um, anyway, this very first frequency that, um, that I made visible showed what looked like an Egyptian hieroglyph, an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph. And it was snaking on the sarcophagus, just like um, the backbone of the god Osiris. You know, it's a um, striations, horizontal striations. And um, anyway, uh, I mean, at this point, the antiquities inspector got ex very excited and he rushed across, across to the sarcophagus. 
And he said, how you do that? How you do that? <laughs> and now he was really animated. You know, he wanted to help now. Oh, I see this Englishman is doing good work, you know. So anyway, he then really did help a lot, actually, in the, in the coming uh, hours to, to run a whole series of frequencies into the sarcophagus. And almost every frequency that we put in, we got something extraordinary in, on, in, in terms of imagery not always hieroglyphs, but there were a lot of hieroglyphs that became visible on the in the sand. Other other shapes looked geometric. Other shapes looked like kind of coral seas. But it was, of course, the hieroglyphic images that excited both of us, you know, so much. And and then within about twenty minutes of making sound in that sarcophagus, I suddenly realized that there was no more pain in my lower back, it had completely cool. gone, cool. right? And I, <laughs> David, you know, at the time, I honestly thought that this was simply endorphins. I was so excited, of course, you know, mm -hmm. at seeing these hieroglyphs, I mean, who wouldn't be? And, uh, and I thought the pain will come back later when I get out of the pyramid, go back to the hotel, you know, I'm gonna be in agony again. But the truth was, that that pain never came back, even though <laughs> I'd had it for three weeks, right? Huh. So this taught me something. I mean, you've got to remember that at this point in my career, David, I was an acoustics engineer. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wasn't. I wasn't actually performing science. I was. I was an engineer, and and I also had no knowledge at all of sound therapy. I was completely ignorant in that area. Um, and so this was a complete surprise to me that the sound had somehow magically, seemingly magically healed my lower back. So that, that really got my attention. And I wanted to understand how could sound do that in 20 minutes when all these painkillers and everything else had gone to physios and everything, you know, in the buildup to going out to Egypt, none of it had worked. But sound within 20 minutes, no pain. Right. right. So right. it did really get my attention. And then the other other aspect, of course, of all of this was seeing these ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs um, mm. appearing in the sand <laughs> told me immediately that this was the this had the potential to be a new tool for science, to you know, a new investigative tool. So that ultimately led to the development of the cymoscope instrument, which now, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you can see actually in the, in the background here behind me, um, which makes sound visible, right? And then mm -hmm. the other thing, of course, is for these last 23 years, I've been researching how does sound heal? How does sound uh, trigger the body's healing response? Let's put it that way. And so it's been a fascinating journey that I've been on, David. Cool, cool. You know, before we go further, I want to ask you the big question because um, there's a lot of philanthropy money that's coming around these days. And I wanted to ask you what I've asked everybody, and that is, if you had all the money in the world, how would you help the people on the planet? <laughs> why, don't you ask me, why don't you ask me a difficult yeah, question? Yeah, just the little questions around here. Well, if I had all the money in the world, well, you know, in terms of um, making the world a better place, one of, the, one of the areas that really gets to me is how much damage is done by people uh, on pharmaceutical, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, interventions of various kinds. So much damage is done to health because of pharmaceuticals. And I'm not saying anything new here. I mean, this is well known mm -hmm. that, that pharmaceutical products, you know, actually cause more harm perhaps in many cases than they do good. And, and why is this? Well, obviously, the primary reason, I guess, is because of um, the way that you know, the pharmaceutical industry has a huge amount of money to spend on mm -hmm. advertising. And of course, one of the reasons that big companies always have money to spend on advertising is because it's a, you know, it's a tax set off. They're making huge profits. And if they don't spend it on advertising, well, you just end up paying more tax to the government, right? So, mm -hmm. so they do spend it on advertising. Well, the result of that is that you know, millions of people all over the world who watch television 
become indoctrinated uh, effectively, you know, by these adverts for pharmaceutical products. So what what I what I would do if I had all this money, you know, of course you can't stop them doing that. But what you can do is you can put out the other side of the coin. You can put out adverts that tell the truth, basically yeah. about the statistics. Uh, you yeah. know uh, of how harmful pharmaceutical products can be. In other words, you, you know you can use this money for to be able to educate people uh -huh. into not necessarily following the the, the pharmaceutical um, direction in every case, but to also um, educate people into use of energy medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, I've just been talking about sound therapy. How sound healed me within 20 minutes. I mean, that's a powerful therapy, and it's only one of many natural alternative therapies that are available. And yet, because there's very little money in alternative therapies, r relatively speaking, um, the, most people, you know, mainstream people don't know about them generally. Uh -huh. So if I had all this money, David, that's what I would do. Education, basically, into alternative uh, therapies, integrative medicine therapies, in other words, and also putting the other side of the coin about the dangers of, of uh, imbibing pharmaceutical products. It, it's, it's not straightforward at all. It, it can do a lot of harm to a body. I know they do good as well. It depends on, on yeah. what they are, but so many people are um, almost press ganged, you know, into taking pharmaceutical products when really right. They should be on natural products. Right. One of our instructors last year uh, had an infection in his foot, went to the doctor and got medication and had a reaction to the medication and passed away. Oh, that's so right? sad. Yeah. It's so yeah. Sad. It's, so, really, um, it's really crazy. I mean, the potential for using sound and vibration to really just, I mean, one day we're going to be able to get, you know, an email. It's just email the doctor, send the frequencies over. Right. And it's like, poof, it's taken care of. Right. No side effects. I mean, already there's so much cool work around around, you know, Absolutely. yeah, cancer and stuff. So, you know, I was a physics major at UC Berkeley. So I uh, teach in detail uh, wave transmission of sound and how it works at all the different levels. And you have this concept that I've seen and I still don't understand completely. And that is that sound is, is also a sphere. So tell me, I mean, because the normal way in physics is, you know, it comes out in a cone shape and it spreads throughout the room, and there, there's interference and non-interference, and there's a full, and it takes time for the sound wave to go across the room, and it's actually compressed air and spaced out air is the actual wave, right? And it's, it's so, so tell me about this concept, because I, I sense there's something really interesting here. Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly, it's not, a, it's not a discovery of mine, David. It's not new. It's not new in physics at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, speak to any any physics professor, and he or she will tell you um, what the shape of sound is, and they will say uh, it's spherical. You know, all audible sounds, at any rate, are, are spherical. But if you ask any you know any um, anyone in the street what's the shape of sound, um, they'll say, "Are you crazy? It's a wave, right?" Well, in my uh, physics class, they didn't say it was spherical. They said it was a wave, and they taught us the the exactly how long the wave will go before it dissipates i mean exactly yeah, right. the the, the yeah. wavelength equals the 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 uh you know speed of sound over the frequency there's even a mathematical formula tell me what the sphere is because okay. I've, I've so never, the, i don't understand it the trip up basically is this use of the word wave okay so i, I just said that any ask any physicist what is the shape of sound or audible sound and they will tell you that it's a sphere and so is light, by the way, all electromagnetism, excepting the specialist case of laser light, but all other electromagnetism is also spherical. Now, the, it's the, the trip up is this word wave. It, it puts us into a mindset where we think of something wiggling through the air, as it were. Um, and, you know, that previous slide showing the young woman with a wave coming out of her mouth. 
that one there, yeah. Um, this is the misnomer, you know, it's the use of the word wave that gives everyone this idea that there's a wave coming out of someone's mouth, for example, and this, you know, uh, seeing this young woman here making a sound. But the reality is completely different. A wave, this kind of wave here, is actually a graph, of course, of energy. Right. It's the way that the energy is, it's a periodicity, it's an it's oscillation. A, it's a map. It's a graph. It. It, yeah, it's a map. Yeah, it's energy a map of the, the high part is compressed air. And whenever yeah. the speaker or the vocal cords push out, it creates compressed air. When the vocal cords or speaker pulls in, it creates spaced out air, which is yeah. the down part of the wave. And that's, Correct. you know, you can, there are even photographs of actual waves using lasers and, 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 and uh, smoke, right? So, yeah, but so that's the, it's not up and down, it's, it's 3D, right? Go ahead. Yeah, but this is the graph, David. You know, nature does not work in graphs. Um, so basically, let me just say it, you know, in a nutshell, all audible sounds are spherical in their space form. There is no sound that you can make that's not spherical in its space form. So where does the term wave come from? It comes from the fact that this bubble, in this case, you can see it em uh, emerging from this young woman's mouth, is oscillating in and out, it's pulsating in and out. So it's not static, of course, it's expanding at the speed of sound, but as it expands, it pulsates in and out. And that is what the shape of audible sounds uh, is. Now, of course, as the frequency increases beyond audibility, if you get up into uh, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 Hertz and higher, then this bubble-shaped emanation starts to flatten. And by the time you get up to the frequencies that dolphins use, which is like 150,000 hertz, then you took, you're looking at the shape of sound more like a searchlight beam or, or a flashlight beam. But audible sounds, everything that we can hear, you know, with a human ear is spherical in its space form. And the reason that I, you know, get on my hobby horse about this, David, the reason that it's so important is because it's necessary to understand that all of the sound therapy and music therapy and music medicine modalities that you and I are so passionate about, when any of these sounds impinge upon a, on a, a person, enter into that person, they automatically create spherical energy, for example, around all of the cells in your body. Where if you're thinking in terms of waves like the wiggle that I showed earlier there, you know, that the, the wiggle coming out of this woman's mouth, that doesn't tell you at all what's actually happening in the body, whereas the sphere does. And it's the oh. same with the cymoscope instrument. What you see in a cymoscope instrument is a 2D slice through that sonic bubble. It's literally showing you the interior of the bubble. That's what it is. And that's why I get so, you know, uh, passionate about this because it's so yeah. important in, uh, in my field, you know, that I'm studying. I see, I, I get that, you know, when you resonate a water droplet, it creates a little, little sphere like exactly like this when you resonate you know even I, you know, I hear you saying when you resonate around like a cell it creates a little sphere but you know when when it travels through air what i mean i, I can't quite understand it, that there there would be mo if there was a little the water droplets in the air would probably be creating that but how big is this and is there one after another or, I mean, no, it's, 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 it's in, physics, in physics, the size of it should be related to the frequency. And I, I mean, how, how does this, I mean, is it just one bubble that moves through the no, air? Yeah, I think you're, you're misunderstanding a little bit, David. I well, don't understand all, at me, all. <laughs> okay, let me say, first of all, that this, let me say, first of all, that this snapshot, you know, this moment in time that you're looking at here with this young woman and the bubble coming out of her mouth, um, that is a, a, a tiny, tiny fraction of, of a second. I mean, it'll be in uh, milliseconds, basically. But within a few milliseconds after this moment, this bubble will start to refract backwards. So within a few milliseconds, the bubble is completely surrounding the young woman's head 
and expanding at the speed of sound, you know, locally, whatever that is. Um, and as it's expanding, now, if you're looking down on the top of this woman's head, you would see the bubble uh, completely surrounding her. If you attribute a color to the amount of energy in the bubble, say a dark blue to the direction in which she's pointing, the direction of propagation, in other words, if it would be a dark blue, say, in that direction. But if you were to look from you know, down on her head, the, bubble, the part of the bubble behind her would, let's say, be a light blue. What does this mean? It means that the amount of energy in propagation terms is far greater in the direction that she's pointing than in the direction behind her. But we all know that if we're walking behind someone down a street and they're having a conversation, you can hear what they're saying. And the reason is because that bubble is refracting backwards, basically. And that's why yeah. you can hear it. Yeah. But as it's, you're talking um, about wavelength, let me explain about the wavelength, right? Mm. This bubble, as it's expanding, is also pulsating in and out. And it's the amount of that pulsation that if you measured that distance, that is the wavelength or multiple wavelengths, of course, if it's a complex sound, um, that is uh, the, the, it's that distance of pulsation, which is the wavelength, as they call it, of the sound. And any physics professor would tell you, David, that the shape of sound is spherical. What they would yeah. term it is a spherical wave. They would use that term, spherical wave. And I... Yeah trying to get rid of this word wave because it does give you this false impression, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. I would just call it, I just call it the sound bubble, basically. Yeah, I don't understand, but let's just continue. I mean, that's <laughs> my, my, not, my physics uh, instructor did not uh, explain it this way and I still don't get oh, it. But, David, but maybe we can talk about it later. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> see how compressed air and spaced out air maps out and how it, you know, I mean, um, I, it says it does it just expand as a sphere further and further. It, it keeps on expanding forever, basically. So it's yes. just one big sphere. Yeah, one big sphere. Okay. Well, okay. So it's not multiple spheres. Okay. Cool. No, one okay. big sphere that pulsating. But of course, if you keep on making a sound, then there are other spheres coming behind it all the time. Well, but it's interesting because oh, I see. But so each syllable would be a different sphere. Exactly. Uh huh. But it doesn't go. And, and, okay, okay, I'm starting to get it, but it's still, it seems like it's refra <laughs> refraction, uh, it's a refraction pattern instead of the actual movement of the, of the sound through, uh, of compressed air and spaced out air. Because when you have a physical vibration, well, a speaker going back and forth, it actually is creating compressed. So what I, I would be interested in is where does the compressed air and the spaced out air actually map to this but that, i don't want to get into this because you've got so many cool things that i would like to con continue with with the things that that you want to share here um by so, the way it's also it's also holographic the sound is holographic which basically means that any molecule on the surface of this expanding sphere contains all the information that the sound contains and there was all of the details of this young woman's voice are contained within every single molecule on the surface of the sphere and inside the sphere. And that's why it's holographic, because of that fact that the same information is on the surface as is inside. Anyway, yeah. let's move yeah, on. That's hard to grok also, but I, it sounds really interesting. So, okay, so tell us about, you know, I mean, the relationship of sound and light. This is a fascinating, a fascinating subject, and it's also very important when it comes to understanding um, some aspects of how sound therapy and music medicine and music uh, therapy also work. So, you know, if if uh, viewers now were to rub their hands together very, very vigorously, like this little chap on the screen, what you would find is that you're you're creating heat. Now, how is that heat being created? Well, the molecules in the skin of one hand are rubbing or slipping past the molecules of the skin in your other hand. And you would, I mean, we would just use the term friction, wouldn't we? We would say that is friction when you rub your hands together. But if you take it right down to the atomic level, what's actually happening is 
that all of the molecules in one hand, they have atomic shells around them. These shells are is mag basically magnetism. So every single atom or every molecule has a shell of magnetism around it. And the same, of course, is true of the atoms and molecules in your other hand. So when you rub your two hands together, and we use this term friction, of course, but when you do that, this friction, what it really is, is the magnetic shells around the atoms and molecules in the two hands are slipping past each other. Now, when this happens, the definition that, that, that would be brought to bear upon this, a scientific definition, would be inelastic collisions. And what that means is, that the molecules of both hands are colliding with each other in this way that creates an exchange of energy. In other words, when there's frictional components between the magnetic shells of the two hands as they rub together, there has to be a release of energy. This release is in the infrared spectrum at the kind of pressure levels that we use when we rub our hands together, okay? So we know that commonly term, termed heat. All right, well, what's another name for heat? Infrared light, okay? So when you rub your hands together like this, what you're actually doing, you're creating sound, because you can hear that sound, can't you, of the two hands rubbing, but also you are creating infrared light. Now, what this, why I'm mentioning all of this is because the same principles that are occurring here by rubbing your hands together are actually occurring in your larynx, in your throat. When you make a sound, you are creating vibrations in the molecules, the atoms and the molecules in the air, right? And that's propagating out of your mouth as a bubble, as we've just talked. But every little collision between the atoms and the molecules in the air are creating what are termed inelastic collisions, which basically means you're creating heat as a consequence of making sound. So whenever you make a sound, it's impossible to not make light. You automatically make infrared light when you make sound at the kind of sound pressure levels that our normal voice creates, or for example, that a sound therapy device makes. All these normal everyday sound pressure levels create infrared light. And the beautiful thing about this, David, is, and the magical thing actually, in a, in a sense, is that all of the light that's created by making sound is modulated in amplitude by the frequencies in the sound, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you make sound outdoors, for example, you go on top of a hill and sing, to, sing like Julie Andrews, you know, uh, sound of music. What's happening is when you sing outdoors, the sound bubble that is created that leaves your mouth at the speed of sound, that will dissipate naturally within about a mile or so of the singer, uh, however good they are, it'll still dissipate into noise basically within about a mile or so um, because the there's heat. not sufficient energy. But the heat will not. The heat that's generated by these inelastic collisions in the sound of that person standing on top of the hill that heat, which is infrared light, will zip through the atmosphere into space, basically, and it will carry the information of that original sound, in this case, someone singing like Julie Andrews, for example, it will carry the information, not as sound per se, but as modulations of the infrared light. Now, this same scientific principle that I'm talking about here, which, which is so important, by the way, for sound therapy and music medicine and so on, which we'll come back to, but the same principle uh, is, is actually being used in the science of asteroseismology, because what an asteroseismologist does is able to listen in to the sounds of stars and hear, literally hear, the sounds that are occurring inside, say, our own sun or in any star. And, and again, you know, probably a lot of viewers will think, but hang on, sound can't travel through a vacuum. That's right, it can't. But the light can, and the light carries the modulations of the sounds in the star. Mm -hmm. So as the sun is making 
you know, all of its atomic furnace, uh, uh, all of the collisions, the millions, the trillions of countless trillions of collisions that are occurring within the sun, they are creating sound. And that sound modulates the light from the sun in a tiny little way, of course, but enough to be detectable by instrumentation on Earth and the SOHO spacecraft, for example, that, that uh, detects the modulations inside the sun. And then you can simply demodulate that light to mm -hmm. retrieve the data and therefore listen in mm -hmm. to the sounds of the sun. So this is the science of astroseismology. But coming back to you know, everyday sounds on Earth and the sounds that we use, for example, in a therapeutic uh, modality, um, whether that be our own vocal apparatus or a Tibetan bowl or a gong or, or an actual, you know, sound therapy device, all of these types of sounds are creating not only sound, but also modulated infrared light. And the reason that this is all so important uh, in terms of sound therapy is because the language of the cells in our body is a language of light. Mm -hmm. So when we make sound, one of the reasons we make sound in a therapeutic setting is because we are actually speaking the language of the cells. Mm -hmm. So because cells communicate in the infrared spectrum, all of the data that they're uh, exchanging all of the time. They're having conversations. You know, brothers and sister cells are talking to each other, s sharing information. And that information is in the infrared spectrum. So that's why this uh, is so important. So the, the cells are getting the coherence of the sound as light in them. So it's yeah, still, it's, 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 it still can be chaos versus ca coherence, right? And so, yeah, because yeah, right. the sound is coherent, it's creating a coherent light uh, uh, pattern. Absolutely. There's so mm -hmm. much to learn in this area. You know, mm -hmm. before we started this, this chat, David, you know, we had a little chat, didn't we, about, you know, how much we don't know, basically. Oh, um, right. There's a huge amount still to learn. So although we know that the language of cells uh, is in the infrared spectrum, and there's a couple of slides further on that you could show that, that mm -hmm. mention this, you know, the area, this is the graphic that's showing you how collisions uh, in sound create infrared light. Uh -huh. um, and then if you go to the next slide, it shows you the area of cell to cell communication you know, almost all of the electromagnetic spectrum that where the information is being transferred between cells is occurring in the infrared spectrum. You can see there's a little bit in the visible and there's even a little bit in the UV spectrum, but most of it is in the infrared spectrum. And, and this is fabulous, isn't it? To know this because all of the sounds that we are creating um, you know, when we're wishing to work with someone with sound, uh, as I said, doesn't matter what the modality, you know, it could be, it could be a Tibetan bowl or it could be a gong or, a, or your own voice or whatever it is or an, or an instrument, but whatever it is, it's creating not only sound, but also infrared light. We still don't know, of course, all of the answers because the receptors on the surface of the cells, some of them, the, these are little integral membrane proteins on the surface of the cells. Some of them are sensitive to sound, others are sensitive to light, and mm. we don't know all of the mechanisms and how they work uh, in relation to um, cellular biology. Boy, certainly... that, that seems like a, a very clear uh, research uh, path to be able to figure out, you know, precisely. I mean, because I start thinking like, okay, you know, what sound even though it's creating light, how can we also, also use light at the same time corresponding to the sound to create a whole field that's totally resonating it into its healthy state and healthy frequency? Well, you can, and there are, there are some devices already in the world, you know, where they're using um, infrared light. And I know mm -hmm. that, that uh, there was some talk about one company actually modulating the infrared light with the sound. Mm -hmm. So you're getting both the benefits of the sound and the modulated infrared light. So, um, but you know, I don't think it takes, from my understanding, the cells of your body are so incredibly sensitive 
It doesn't mm -hmm. take a, a lot of infrared mm -hmm. to actually uh, excite them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that just normal sounds is, is probably almost certainly mm -hmm. one of the many mechanisms, the biological mechanisms at work in the body when you make sound. You know, but we can't separate the fact that, that the sound is creating the light and almost certainly, um, you, and you can never separate them basically, so you could never have a sound mm -hmm. without light, right? Uh -huh. So we cannot really know, uh, you know, is it the sound, primarily the sound that's actually triggering the body's healing response or is it primarily the light component of the sound? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. something that we do need to, uh, to pin down as soon as as soon as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so, how does sound? And you must. It sounds like you really got interested in this. How does sound mediate pain? Well, that's actually really that's really simple uh, to explain. You know, when I I talked earlier, right at the beginning, about how. Um, within 20 minutes, all the pain in my body left me. Now, there are, there are two primary mechanisms at work, or there were two primary mechanisms at work in that great pyramid healing <clears throat> all those years ago. One of them definitely was mediating uh, pain because all that pain left me. But of course, it wasn't the only mechanism. How do we know this? Because the pain never came back. Whereas, you know, pain mediation by sound, which I'm about to explain, you know, how that works, that is a kind of temporary fix. It's not permanent. Whereas there are other mechanisms that I will describe later, if we get the chance, that, that explain how the sound creates the permanent fix, if you like. But let's just, first of all, talk about pain mediation by sound. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's quite a simple uh, effect actually in the body to understand because our, the surface of our body, not only the surface, but internally as well, we have countless thousands of nociceptors. These are the nerve endings basically. Um, and nerve endings are the three basic types of nerve fiber. They all have these terminations called nociceptors. But the most important thing to know about nociceptors in relation to sound is that all of them, all of these three types of what they call afferent fibers, uh, these types of nerve fibers, all of them are sensitive to mechanical pressure. And of course, we know that sound is indeed a mechanical pressure. So the important thing is that to understand about this mechanism is that when we apply the correct frequencies of sound to the body, what happens is that the nociceptors pick up the vibrations of the, this frequency and send messages through the dorsal horn of the spinal column and they rush up into the midbrain. And when they get into the midbrain, automatically the brain creates opiates. So uh, this is the, the way that the body, and this, is a, this is a natural process, basically. So I'm not talking here about anything that's not natural. This is natural. So let me give you an example of what I mean by natural in the, in the case of pain mediation. You know, if someone kicks you in the shins, for example, which is a very, very painful uh, thing to happen. Um, if you immediately, you know, grab your shin where somebody's kicked you and you press very tightly, of course, the pain subsides significantly. It's reduced significantly. And that's because of the same mechanism that I'm just describing here, that when you put pressure on the nociceptors, that automatically sends a signal to the midbrain and the midbrain creates opiates. And the job of the opiates basically is to mask the pain. So it is a temporary fix, you know, yeah. but the opiates don't disappear instantly they will linger on for some hours afterwards. So it's quite, a, you know, it's not entirely temporary. I mean, it's quite, length, you know, it goes on for quite a long time, the effect afterwards, but of course, gradually diminishing if you take away the sound frequencies that are causing the mediation of the pain or creating the mediation of the pain. 
So in that's it in a nutshell. It's very it's a very simple thing. What's not so simple, of course, is understanding and identifying the optimal frequencies needed mm -hmm. in order to stimulate this natural system of the body. But it's because of the frequent, the low frequencies in particular that I was using when I first started the experiments in the King's Chamber. Those low frequency, low frequencies were stimulating all the nociceptors, not only in my lower back, of course, but all over my body and sending. Um, so I was literally immersed in low frequency sound. My whole body was. And all of those signals were going to my midbrain and basically causing a huge release of opiates, which completely masked the pain. So all the pain disappeared. But then later we can, you know, if we've got the time, David, we can let's, talk about why did the pain never come back, basically. Let's because do it now. That's like the important part. Let's do it now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what everybody, I, I mean, goodness gracious, we want to get rid of pain forever, not just for a bit. <clears throat> Right? Okay. I remember when I was in the hospital with appendicitis, they, every time they would pull the, the tape off from the IV, I would scream, right? And I wouldn't feel pain, right? And I even broke a rib once and I screamed. And I felt no pain. And the doctor said, I said, you know, uh, when I scream, there's no pain. He says, you know why that is? He says that the cell receptors can only handle so much information. And when you fill it up with sound, there's no more uh, room for the information of the pain going to the brain. But if, of course, when I stopped screaming, it would come back. Although if you're just pulling <laughs> the IV off, you know, then it's only well, there for yeah, a minute. But don't forget here, you know, that, that when you scream, or let's say you hit your thumb with a hammer or something, you know, you, you shout out, don't you, immediately, ow, ah! you know. Well, that is high pressure sound, which is, you know, exactly what your nociceptors need mm -hmm. in order to mediate the pain. So not only would you hold your thumb tightly like this, you know, um, but also you would scream, you would shout out. And both those things actually help to mediate the pain. It's a, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? You know, how, yeah. how sound therapy works. There's but another, th another thing I've ahead. noticed. I'm, I'm sorry. There's another thing I've noticed that's really effective. If you get a tuning fork or some vibration on a bruise or a burn right after it happens, it will stop it from going into a whole pain response. And it's dramatic how, much, how well it can, can stop it from, from hurting over the next few days. Well, that's the same mechanism. It's the, opi it's the nociceptors that are sending, you know, via the afferent fibers straight into the midbrain. Opiates are, natural opiates are created. And that effect will last for some hours after, you know, depending on how, how, um, how long you use the tuning for, for but certainly you will get good relief for quite a long period of time if you do it, especially if you do it quickly, as you said, David. Yeah. So how does it work? How do we get rid of pain forever? I can't wait. <laughs> tell me, tell me. No, I'm not. I, I, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that you get rid of the pain forever. In, in, in that well, sense. yours went away. Yeah, I know. But but there's two, there are two primary mechanisms here. One okay. is the mediation of pain that we just talked about. The other can, in this case, you know, there are many forms of illness, of course, but one of the, um, one of the aspects of standard biology that's very, very well known um, is that when a system of the body is challenged in some way, in this case, you know, my lower back was significantly damaged, you know, doing something stupid that I did three weeks before going out to Egypt, um, lifted something awkwardly, you know, caused my whole lower back to go into a spasm. And, um, but, you know, just coming back to kind of general terms, illness um, has many forms, of course, but one of the most important areas to, to know about in terms of how sound can uh, actually reverse illness is in terms of cells going into a, a sleep state so what happens is that, that when a cell or a system of cells, let's say, uh, is challenged in some way, in my case, you know, damaging my lower back through lifting something in a silly way, uh, what happens is that the cells of that system go into uh, what's called the G the G zero phase. If you come back one slide, 
um, you know, to the previous slide there, David. Um, yeah, here, this is it. If you, um, you see this, that circle on the left, it's got G0 in the center. It's not, that's not saying go, by the way, that's G0. And what this is, the circle is representing uh, a cell within a system of cells in the, in the body, okay? And so in other words, that white circle is representing the membrane of the cell. Um, and in the center, we have the legend saying G0 quiescent. What this means is that this system of the body, in this case, has gone to sleep. And why does the system go to sleep? Well, in this case, my lower back had been you know, mistreated, basically. And, um, and so the, all of the cells in the muscles of my lower back had gone into a sleep state, this quiescent state known as the G0 phase of the cell cycle. Well, naturally, if you've got a system of the body that is not operating the way it's supposed to because the cells are literally asleep, why are they asleep? Well, they're trying to heal themselves. They want to recover from the trauma of, you know, in this case, what I did to my lower back. But the same principles apply to many different illnesses and many different types of um, trauma or, or like say an invasion of a pathogen into your body or the invasion of some, or the imbibing of some toxic substance, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, all of these different forms of illness uh, can, can cause the system of the body to go to sleep, basically. And of course that knocks the whole system of your body out of balance. You're then way out of balance because there's a whole system that's not functioning correctly. Now, um, if you read the medical literature about the phases of the cell, and in this particular case, the G0 phase, the quiescent phase, where the, the cell is essentially in a coma-like state, waiting for healing to occur. If you read the medical literature, it will tell you that um, the cell either needs rest, um, you know, which is probably why a lot of medical doctors say you need a good rest, you know, and, and there's a lot of truth in that because time is a great healer mm -hmm. and time, if you allow the body enough time and support it with, you know, good nutrition and so on, uh, it will eventually, in many cases, it will recover itself without external intervention. Um, so the medical literature, medical literature does talk about time as one of the healing mechanisms. Um, and it also does talk about nutrition, that if you have really, if you support this system of your body that's gone to sleep with good nutrition, that will speed up the process of healing. But of course, you know, where you and I, um, what we know is that sound is also an extraordinarily effective uh, way of supporting the body through illness. And hypothetically, what I'm saying here is, you see there where you've got this, these arrows and the word stimulus. What this means is, what I'm talking about is that sound is a form of energy, of course, and just as food is, you know, just as nutrition is. And so what I'm saying is, hypothetically, because this is not proven, but it's almost certainly the case that what's happening is that the sound actually awakens the cell. So in the Great Pyramid, you know, when... First of all, I had the pain mediation, which was great. I was suddenly pain-free within 20 minutes. But then the other effect that was occurring was that the cells in my lower back were gradually being awoken from their sleep state. In other words, in this case, coming out of spasm, right? And this is a hypothetical because, as I say, not yet proven, but almost certainly from all of the work that I've done, uh, is showing that this is the case, that the cells are awoken, awakened by, the, by this input of sound energy. And um, again, you know, some sound frequencies are um, more efficacious for certain types of mm -hmm. cells that have gone to sleep than others. So in other words, we have to identify the, right. the optimal frequencies. But there are some, there are lots of sound modalities, as you know, where the, there's a very wide range of sounds that are provided. Um, for example, gongs, Tibetan bowls, and other 
musical sources or mm. rich, you know, tapestries of frequencies. Mm. And I think the reason that they're so, um, they work so well in, in healing and in, in triggering the body's healing response is because of, of this fact that all you've got all of those wonderful harmonic frequencies available as a form of nutrition for cells mm -hmm. that need it. So the mm -hmm. cells that are depleted of energy, or in this case, in a quiescent state in the G0 phase, they are awakened by this beautiful um, array of frequencies that they're suddenly bathed in, you know, when a sound practitioner provides this uh, lovely sound sonic environment, the cells begin to awaken. And I believe that is why all those hours later, after getting out of the pyramid, um, there was no pain. So it wasn't only pain mediation, it was also the fact, I believe it was a fact, that the cells in my lower back had been awoken from their sleep state and returned to normality, basically. So that's right. that's it in, wow. in a nutshell, David. Cool. I get it. So, so it seems like some research that would be really cool is to, uh, to, to, for different types of pain, test, first of all, whether we can uh, do the research and find the frequency that will work the best, whether that works better than a full range of frequencies like you're talking about with the gong, or whether even you know white noise could be the deal because then now you're getting all the different frequencies that could give it and see which one of those is the most effective for different types of pain and then we can even then we because maybe instead of spending all this time trying to find a frequency for each type of pain we could just go <laughs> <laughs> right that's it <laughs> Well, David, you're, you're right on here because um, <laughs> you know, we can go on to, if there's time, we can go on to talk about the work that I did with Professor G uh, in terms of uh, immersion of uh, blood, human blood in musical frequencies. Because one of, the, one of the things that we discovered in that series of experiments was that white noise is almost as effective uh, as music. And um, it's very important if you're using white noise, which, you know, for um, your viewers that don't know what this is, like you've just made that lovely rushing yeah. sound. Shh. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, in nature, if you stand by a waterfall or a very, very busy river or the, the ocean shore, for example, you're being bathed in huge amounts of, of, uh, of white noise, which, by the way, goes way up into the kind of low ultrasound ranges. So, you, mm. you know, up to sort of mm. 60,000 hertz, wow. the frequencies go up there. So you're uh, not only uh, being bathed in, um, in noise, which is, you know, all of the audible spectrum, but, but a lot of frequencies that, that we can't even hear, you know, go, going up to about 60,000, which of course, ultrasound is a, a very well-known uh, therapeutic modality. So no wonder when you go for a walk by the seashore, you know, uh, you come back feeling great. You know, there are very many reasons for that. One is, of course, the white noise that we're just talking about. But of course, also there are negative ions. Right. There's also the effects of fresh air, you know, more oxygen and all, all sorts of effects are, are, are okay. happening. Not to mention all the light that's going to be coming out of all those different frequencies. Is that, why, is that why we wear sunglasses at the beach? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. Anyway, it's Never it's mind. a fascinating subject. But do we have time to talk about the um, the work that I did with Professor G? Uh huh. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, this is really interesting work, and and um, you know, there's a this was inspired actually by um, Pythagoras. You know, who two thousand five hundred years ago <clears throat> said that that uh, music could be used in place of medicine. One of his biographers, Ion Blickus, said that. Um, so I realized after a lot of thought, you know, into, into music therapy, music medicine and sound therapy, I realized that there'd been very little research conducted in terms of proving from a biological perspective what was happening when, you know, cells are immersed in a musical environment, for example. Um, so I designed a series of experiments using human blood, 
so this is you know in vitro it's not uh with uh, actual people so we're taking the blood from a person in a test tube environment um, and then immersing that blood in a musical environment and the way it works really simple and, and the and the work and the discoveries that came from this are really quite extraordinary david and i think you and your, your viewers will will find this work really really interesting and and helpful to know so just in a nutshell what we did was uh, professor g is from rutgers university by the way in the usa uh, he came he visited our lab here and we ran the first series of experiments together yeah he actually devised the uh, the scientific test protocol and and what it involves is um you take a test tube of human blood whole blood and you decant it into two smaller test tubes and uh, and then um basically the one test tube is put into a very quiet environment in our case we have a faraday cage which is a really quiet room but it's also electromagnetically screened and in that little quiet uh, faraday cage we have an incubator so we can we can keep the blood at normal you know body uh, blood temperature in the incubator and then the other vial uh, we put that into um, a laboratory incubator. In other words, it's sitting on the bench, in the lab bench. And in that incubator, we have a small speaker. So now we can um, immerse that blood in a musical environment. So we've got one in the quiet environment and one in the musical environment. And according to Professor G, the, I, the optimal time for immersion for an, a biological effect is 20 minutes. So 20 minutes in the quiet environment for one vial, 20 minutes in the musical environment for the other vial. And then after that, we go through a, a test protocol that involves diluting the blood by a certain ratio with a buffer solution. And then we mix it with a special kind of dye that, that identifies which cells are alive and which cells are dead, <clears throat> right? It's really simple. Mm -hmm. and, and then we put, put the blood into um, a special uh, cell counter. This is a special machine that literally mm. counts the number of cells that are alive and the numbers that are dead. Mm. And the way this works is, it's a really clever little system. Um, this dye that I mentioned, this blue dye, it's called Tripan Blue, it, it will automatically leach into any cell that is dead it will also leach into any cell that's beginning to die. I'm talking now about red blood cells here, by the way. Mm. So it will get into any cell that's dead and get into any cell that's on its way out. It's old, in other words, and it's starting to die. But it will not get into any cell that's healthy and lie, healthy and well, you know. So all the red blood cells that are, you know, vibrant, the, the, the dye will not be able to penetrate. And then the, the red um, blood cells that, that are just simply counted by the cell counter and you come up with a number. Well, the, David, the results were absolutely amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing. Every time we tested any type of music, any genre of music, wow. we got way more living red blood cells than we did from the quiet environment. So, and the reason for this is quite simple to understand. In a test tube of blood, any test tube of human blood that's in, you know, uh, uh, that's been taken from a human, put into a test tube, you will always have millions and millions of red blood cells that are alive, millions that are already dead, hmm. and millions that are, that are in a kind of transitory state. They're, they're classed in a biological language as simply being old, right? They're on the way hmm. out, and ultimately they would die in your body and they would be mocked up by your normal bodily systems and replaced of course all of the time in your body with new red blood cells but in this case um all of the cells that were in the transitory state that were in the musical environment are made whole again oh. by the music oh my right? god they are made whole within 20 minutes and what this means is that the, that the blue dye cannot penetrate those cells that have been made whole again within 20 minutes. And so the, the cell counter is telling us, wow, 
you know, all of these musical, all of the cells in the music environment, now we have way, way more cells that are alive than from the quiet environment that have had no input of music at all. Now, this is, a, this is really, really exciting stuff. And the mechanism that underpins this, you're going to really love this. <laughs> it's, really quite, it's really quite something. Um, the mechanism is essentially oxygen. So what happens is that when particularly the low frequencies in music, what happens is that, you know, in your, in your body, you have a heart. And that heart's job is um, essentially, of course, to cause uh, circulation of blood around your body. But it has another function. It's not just circulating the blood. It's also creating pressure pulses. In other words, your heart beat. Every time your heart beats, it's creating a sonic pressure, a low frequency sonic pressure pulse mm -hmm. in your mm -hmm. circulatory system. Mm -hmm. And the hemoglobin molecules in your red blood cells cannot uptake the oxygen that's dissolved in the blood. Every time you breathe in air into your lungs, you're obviously oxygenating your blood, right? But the hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cells cannot take, cannot uptake that oxygen until there's a pulse of low frequency sound, which is mm. the heartbeat. You know mm. what happens if your heart stops? You lose consciousness within seconds, right? You black out uh, because your brain needs oxygen all the time, and, and you just take it away for a couple of seconds, and you would lose consciousness, right? It's so it's that critical to keep your heart beating, right? But the mechanism that underpins all of that is simply that you need a pressure pulse to cause the hemoglobin molecules to absorb the oxygen that's dissolved in the blood. Stop the heart, no more he uptake of oxygen, therefore you black out. But that's, of course, just part of the story. There's a lot more to it. However, now think about music, particularly the low frequencies in music right when they enter into your body and many of the low frequencies actually pass right through your body when they do that they have an effect on your blood on your circulatory system very similar to the heart itself in other words they cause the hemoglobin molecules to uptake more oxygen okay and that availability of oxygen by the hemoglobin causes all sorts of repair mechanisms to be accelerated in your body. And in this case, in the test tube, the low frequencies from the speaker, from the musical effects that we were, you know, musical choices that we were immersing the, the blood in, those particularly low frequencies were causing the repair of all of these millions and millions of transitory red blood cells that were then counted as alive. So now we've got real evidence, good solid evidence that the low frequencies in particular are feeding this mechanism that increases the oxygen, more oxygen, more healing. And uh, oh, it's so exciting. And the next stage I of this work, by the way, David, is, the, um, is to count instead of red blood cells, we'd be counting leukocytes. Uh, these are the white blood cells or T cells in your blood that of course are mopping up all of the pathogens that you know we're are coming into your body all of the time. Which so we're now interested in, okay, we've got this wonderful mechanism happening with the red blood cells. What is happening with the leukocytes? Mm -hmm. So that's the, the next stage of the work, but it is really, really exciting work. You you know, as I've mentioned, I always talk about flow as being a large part of what we need in our system. And so it's interesting. I would want to see is it just the low frequencies playing a stable note or is it the low frequencies changing over time which are creating also a rhythm and actually creating a flow that is actually triggering that oxygen intake and that's a very good question david really mm -hmm. good question and um you know i don't know the answer to it there's a lot of work you know to be conducted yet but what we can say is that all of these different types of music that we tried, um, <clears throat> including you know, many different genres of, of popular music, 
but also classical music um, and white noise, as we mentioned, you know, uh -huh. um, the, the best effects, the, the, the most red blood cells that were alive were with popular music. So not with wow. classical, you know, the classical music produced pretty good effect because, um, you know, there are lots of, there's a lot of classical music that does have a quite a good bass register, mm -hmm. but, but all of the pieces that we tried, the classical music did not create anywhere near um, the benefits of the popular music. The popular <laughs> music was way, way better um, wow. than, than the classical. I know it's it makes me, it makes me it makes me think about the kick and the bass creating that rhythm that's so, so similar to the heart, right? Absolutely, it's right. very similar right. to the heart. Uh huh. Yes, right. So right. it's really exciting. Oh my God! So this is like a portal as to, I mean, by using the cells in this really cool system that sounds like it's so, so precise that uh, we could do a whole range of studies on, on, and really figure, figure out a lot. Okay. Uh, I love it. Absolutely. I love it. This is very and, cool. And the, next, and the next stage of the work, you know, mentioning the leukocytes, that will have to be uh, conducted uh, in vivo. In other words, you know, live volunteers mm -hmm. will come to our lab and be tested um by being immersed in a musical environment and uh so that's you know we're planning all of that right now um so do we have any time left david or how are we doing yeah just a, another five or ten minutes we've got okay well w would you like us to end with the the segment on um the, the subject of uh differentiating between the sounds of cancer cells and, yes. and healthy cells excellent excellent let me go to that slide yeah. So by this is your cymoscope, right? This is the cymoscope instrument, actually, and you can see it behind me here as well, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so this is a this is really again very interesting work, and it has a, a lot of potential um, in terms of natural um, being able to heal with with natural methods instead of with pharmaceuticals, basically. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So. It's, yeah, go ahead, David. Yeah. As as I always say, the war, more ways you lead a horse to water the more chances it'll drink so if you can use sound and then visuals and light all at the same time you know i think there's way Absolutely. more potential and that's what gary buchanan was doing a lot of work with who just passed away yeah doing yeah. both light and sound where he was modulating the light specifically to the frequencies of the sound and then yeah, putting the light on the body i was very sad to hear that gary buchanan had passed yeah, he was yeah, doing some really yeah. excellent work so yeah. um Anyway, so coming back to, um, to this work, <clears throat> it was um, concerning, not that particular slide, by the way, because we've already talked oh, about that one uh, before. Yeah, yeah we can go, you can land on that one if you like. Okay. Because this, cool. this is showing the difference when we image the sound of a cancer cell versus imaging the sound of a healthy cell. This was work that was inspired by um, Professor James Jimzeski originally, who's at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And um, many years ago, I think it was 2002 or 2003, he kickstarted this whole new science of uh, what he called sonocytology, basically mm -hmm. the sound of cells. He was the first to discover that every cell in our body has its own unique song, if you like. Um, every type of cell has its own unique song. And he, all those years ago, even then, he was talking about, you know, I wonder if uh, cancer cells have a completely different song to a healthy cell, you know, in terms of uh, types of song. And, uh, and so this research really was inspired by Jim Zesky's own ideas all those years ago. And so how we did this was, uh, with, again, with Professor G and uh, collaborating with Professor G, we, um, you know, he, going back to Jim Zesky, he was using an atomic force microscope, um, which literally is a way of uh, listening in to the sound of cells with a little tiny cantilever that, that touches the surface of the cell. It's a very difficult uh -huh. uh, thing to do. But nowadays, there's a much easier, much simpler uh, and less expensive, by the way, method using Raman spectroscopy. And what this is, uh, this is using a laser light. So you basically, you, you fire laser light at not one cell, but a whole bunch of cells, basically. 
And so you don't need to be quite so sensitive with your instruments because you're listening to the sounds of thousands of cells, typically not just a single cell. And what happens is when the laser, which is unmodulated light, just normal uh, coherent light, when that strikes the, the area where there are thousands of cells in, your, in the tissues, the light becomes modulated, in other words, slightly fluctuating in sympathy with the respiration of the membranes of all those cells. So all the cells are you know, having the same song in a local area. Um, so if you fire that laser at healthy tissue, it will be modulated by the songs of all of those cells in that area. And similarly, if you fire the laser at a tumor, say a cancerous tumor, it will be modulated by all the cells of that, that are making that hmm. song in the tumor. And so cool. we, we worked with the songs of cancer cells and healthy cells from brain tissue in this case. And, um, and this is what we found, that the healthy cells create a coherent and harmonious and symmetrical imagery Whereas the cancer cells create this, uh, what I would call it, uh, subjectively anyway, I would call it rather ugly and skewed uh, imagery. And sometimes the differences are much more subtle. I mean, I've given you a quite extreme example here, you know, to look at. And sometimes, quite honestly, they're not quite so uh, obvious to the eye mm -hmm. as what you see here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and therefore, you need a system that can differentiate between the two patterns, if you like, when they're made visible with the cymoscope instrument, you need a system that can, can say, well, which one's healthy and which one's cancerous, right? And so Professor G invented his system called Planckian distribution equation, which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically <laughs> it's an analytical system that allows um, a computer to tell immediately which cell is creating a healthy, mm. harmonious pattern and which one is cancerous. Mm -hmm. And the idea, the initial idea behind this was that a surgeon would wear special uh, spectacles, some kind of a glasses system with a little camera in it, a little projector rather, that would tell um, immediately wh when they're scanning the laser across the tissues, they've got someone open, whether it be brain or, you know, in the torso of a person, for example, and they're scanning the laser across the, the, the tissues and they're seeing where is the tumor, where are the, where are the boundaries of the tumor and where does the healthy tissue begin, okay? Because the surgeon wants to cut that tumor out. Mm. But apparently, um, and, you know, I'm not a surgeon, so I don't know the degree of difficulty, but I've been told that it's not always cut cut and dry where the margins of the tumor are. Mm. It's mm. very important, of course, to cut out all of the tumor and leave nothing behind that's cancerous. And this system would allow exactly that to happen. The laser is scanned across the tissues and the feedback that comes through the cymoscope into the, into the glasses of the surgeon would tell him or her immediately which cells are cancerous and which cells are healthy and, and therefore where to cut. But the promise of this technology for the future is even more exciting than that, because of course, if you can listen in to the sounds of cells by a Raman spectroscopy, and we know that you can, mm -hmm. then it should be possible <clears throat> to greatly amplify the sound, for example, of the tumor cells, greatly amplify it and send that sound back in to the tumor um, in which case the tumor would immediately absorb through the through simple resonance principles, it would absorb more energy than it can can take. Turn and the volume up. Uh, yeah, basically you're turning the volume up and those cells would absorb yeah. that song yeah. immediately because it's their song, but too much energy causes destruction and therefore cool. the tumor cells would be eradicated. Um, and, and it's a wonderful concept to be thinking about for the future where you could eradicate uh, cancer, not only in tumors, but also in blood and any other place in the body, simply through sound of the correct uh, complex frequencies, the mm -hmm. same sounds that the cancer cells themselves are making. And that's a really wonderful and exciting 
prospect for the future, isn't it? Yeah. Oh my God. I'm so excited about that because you know the work with Anthony Holland. He's he was so excited. It's like oh, we got rid of 30 to 60 percent of the cancer was would explode with these two frequencies. But it's really I was, I was thinking what maybe it's like a whole combination of of hundreds of frequencies that would actually make up this harmonic structure of the cell. And when you map it like exactly like you're talking about, maybe even a musical flow to its actual structure, you could destroy a hundred percent of them. And it seems you like you hundred percent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So this is all inspired by James Jimzeski. And I believe wow. he wanted to do something similar himself all those years ago. He's gone off in the different directions now. But now, you know, Professor G and I are kind of following up on, on his work. And uh -huh. um, it's really exciting, really exciting stuff. Cool. Wow. So anything else you see in the future? <laughs> I, think got, I think I've got enough on my plate. Yeah, right it's now. like, oh my God, yeah, right, right. With what I'm doing. But, um, you know, the cymoscope instrument is a really wonderful tool that was inspired, you know, from my 97 experiments in the Great Pyramid. Uh -huh. um, you know, when you can make something visible, David, you can understand it at a far deeper level than you can with your other senses. And that's really what we're doing. And every aspect of our world that every single aspect creates sound so and it doesn't matter what science you talk about the cymoscope instrument can be used to uh, to support that science and so it's really you know i'm really excited about the future for the cymoscope instrument and i mentioned uh, or you mentioned rather at the beginning in your introduction that we are developing a junior cymoscope because this is you know, the, the, the professional cymoscope is actually quite expensive, but the junior cymoscope will mm. not be, uh, be much more accessibly priced. And therefore, students and teachers will be able to use it, you know, in the classroom situation. And um, I, I see a really bright future for the cymoscope instrument. And um, I'm really excited. I'm really excited about working with the kids because, you know, we've done the whole, we've got the whole range of, of, um, <clears throat> of exercises for children for every age group and we get into the whole thing is once they get around 12 or so we're teaching the physics of vibration not just sound the physics of vibration so they've been using wave machines and devices like this oh my god it's really the potential is huge to to oh, have, agree, have fun I, yeah i mean it's so important to to involve children um, in cymatics and you know I'm it's it's a very big part of, of what I want wish to achieve in this lifetime is mm. to inspire children all over the world so I'm writing a book uh, for children and I'm also writing uh, teaching courses for children and um, yeah it's, it's going to be really exciting in the future I hope you can make it to our, our panel on uh, sound education the uh, association, which is, I think, uh, like 1.30 on Sunday, the 15th of November. I know hope you. so. Well, send me yeah. the information, David. I hope uh -huh. I can make it. Uh -huh. Cool. Well, I really appreciate all of your intense work, your you. expertise and experience, um, and what you're doing. It's, it's really just really inspiring. Well, thank you so much, David. You know, one of the aspects of your work that I've been reading about recently <clears throat> um, in, in how you are beginning to make inroads into hospital environment, how you are, you know, inspiring people mm -hmm. to uh, change the way that, that the doctors think about use of alternative um, modalities such as sound and music. <clears throat> I think it's really wonderfully inspirational. So thank you so much for all that you are doing. Thank you. I think we're on the threshold of a major change in the world, really. I agree. <clears throat> well, okay. Best to you. Best to you. I'm, let me play the closing video and we'll end here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.